Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today. Today is October 3rd, 2024, believe it or not. Um, and we are here at the COVID Information Commons Student Working Group. Um, welcome. My name is Emily Rothenberg, and I am the program manager of the National Student Data Corps, and that's the KICS um, sister program underneath the Northeast Big Data Innovation Hub here at Columbia University's Data Science Institute. I'm also a member of the COVID Information Commons project team. Today is a very special meeting as we will be hearing from some of our 2024 Kick Student Paper Challenge winners as they present their winning research on a variety of topics related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Each of our speakers will engage with you all directly answering your questions about their work during a live Q&A session at the end of their presentations. I should note that we at the KIC are committed to providing a supportive and welcoming environment to everyone who works, studies, and interacts with the NEBD Hub community at public events. We encourage you to review our code of conduct for online programs. This includes information about conduct reporting and accessibility features. I will drop a link to those resources in the chat in just a moment. This afternoon, I want to also introduce you to another member of the NABD Hub, on, actually two members now, on the Hub call. Um, we have Florence Hudson, who is our Executive Director, who will be chatting with you all in just a moment. And Lauren Close, who many of you know well, is our Operations and Communications Manager. So now I would like to pass the microphone over to Florence to give a quick introduction about the COVID Information Commons. Thank you, Emily, and thank you, Lauren, for everything you do to enable this environment and community. And hello, everyone, and welcome. We're so excited that you could join us today um, to hear from our COVID Information Commons Student Paper Challenge winners this year, or as we call it, the KICK SPC. Everything needs an acronym. And we're very fortunate that the COVID Information Commons is funded by the National Science Foundation. They contacted us in March of 2020 when COVID-19, when everything shut down and COVID-19 was growing and asked us to create an open portal for anyone to be able to easily find National Science Foundation funded research related to COVID. When they contacted us, there were 32 NSF awards related to COVID. Um, so we got that started by the end of 2020, there were about 700. And then we suggested that we include NIH awards. So we were very fortunate to get a follow on award in 2021 for the kick extension. And now we have over 13,000 NSF and NIH funded COVID related awards. And we're fortunate that the funding includes this kick student paper challenge. So the students participate and the winners actually share in some modest incentives, but nevertheless, it's always wonderful to have that. We also have a research explorer machine learning maps tool, which is very cool. If you haven't tried it, you can just go to the kick homepage, covidinfocommons.net, and it does machine learning clustering of the COVID awards. So you can find thematic um, areas of projects and researchers to collaborate with. There are many other, um, as you can see, resources. We have the lightning talks from our monthly and quarterly researcher lightning talk webinars. We have over 140 of them now, all of them in English, most of them in Spanish, um, translation written, and then also now French and Hindi to make it more accessible, all this information around the planet. So um, thank you so much again, Emily, for organizing all this and everyone who's joining us today. Thank you, Florence. So um, before we get into today's um, presentations, I want to highlight the semester project that our student working group currently has access to through the KIC. This fall, we launched a new project which teaches data essentials. Using a data set from the CDC on long COVID symptoms, we are encouraging students to build a research project which includes a data dashboard, a written analysis, a visual presentation, and more. Students will learn the basics of data science ethics, data cleaning, and hypothesis testing. It should take about 40 hours to complete, and students can work on their own schedule to complete the project for a certificate. And if you're interested in getting an additional certificate, you will have the opportunity to sign up to present your findings like our students will be doing today, present your research findings on our December 6th student working group call. So I'll drop these links in the chat below in just a moment so that you can check out our website to learn more. 
And speaking of student researchers, the kick would like to offer again a very big congr uh, congratulations to the winners of the 2024 kick student paper challenge. We will be hearing four student presentations today. We recommend that you listen in and come up with questions for the student researchers as they present. Questions can be broad, like how did you come up with your research question, or specific about maybe a particular graph that they had in their presentation. Their research can really support you in your own scientific research journey, so feel free to drop questions in the chat or save them for a live Q&A at the end. So to begin, I would like to welcome our first speaker, Akshaya, a first place winner of the undergraduate cohort from Ohio University to present her research on COVID-19's effect on children's IQ levels. Akshaya, you're muted. Uh, sorry, thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm so honored to present my research today in front of you guys. Of course. Mm. Yeah, I hope you can see my screen. Yes, this is perfect. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Akshya. Uh, I'll be presenting my research on the topic of impact of COVID-19 on children's IQ, focusing on the cognitive and developmental uh, challenges faced during the pandemic, as well as strategies for recovery. Uh, introducing myself, my name is Akshya Garapali. I'm an undergraduate student in Ohio University, majoring in biological science, specialized in neuro. I have dropped my email address if anyone want to reach out. Uh, today, we'll be looking at how uh, COVID-19 affected the IQ levels in students and uh, look at the socioeconomic disparities, uh, which resulted in increased level of uh, decreased level of IQ levels and a case study and the health impacts of COVID-19 and then discuss about it. Uh, to begin with, uh, let's look at the global uh, impact of COVID-19. The COVID-19 uh, pandemic has dramatically altered the daily lives, leading to uh, severe consequences worldwide. Millions of lives were lost and uh, econom economies were severely suffered. The implementation of the lockdown and the shift to virtual learning has a significant interruption in children's education and social engagement. These disruptions has raised concerning uh, uh, these disruptions have raised concerning children uh, effects on children's intellectual uh, capacities and uh, holistic cognitive development. The pandemic has not only disrupted the uh, uh, educational practices that has uh, also significantly impacted children's uh, social interactions and emotional well-being. As we know, early years are crucial for cognitive development and the challenges posed by a pandemic could have long-lasting effects. Uh, now let's discuss the effects of IQ levels. Uh, research shown that children's born during the uh, pandemic have exhibited reduced verbal, motor, and uh, cognitive performances compared to their pre-pandemic peers. In particular, studies indicated that a measurable decre decline in average IQ scores, which can be attributed to several factors, including uh, increased parental stress, decreased cognitive stimulations, uh, many children face less interaction with peers and educators, which were vital for cognitive development. For instance, the lack of uh, in-person learning experiences means that the children missed out on uh, critical hands-on activities that foster the learning, uh, learning and engagement. This has led to an apprehension, uh, apprehension about a long-term impact on intellectual development. Uh, a crucial aspect to consider is the socioeconomic disparities. These, uh, trans uh, the transition to online learning exposed significant gaps in access to technology. Uh, lower income families often struggle to provide uh, real, reliable internet and uh, devices for their children's education. The digital divide has uh, profound implications. 
uh, disadvantaged ho household not only allocated fewer hours for their children's education, but also had increased dropout rates. Moreover, children with disabilities, uh, learning impairments, or uh, uh, couldn't have access to tailored education, which has worsened worsen their, cha worsen their challenges, highlighting the urgent need for uh, targeted interventions. Uh, to illustrate these challenges, I have conducted a case study involving a 17-year-old student, Indian student. Bef uh, before the pandemic, the student has achieved an impressive score of 466 out of 470 in their uh, junior year of high school. However, during their freshman year in uh, college, they experienced a marked decline in academic performances. Uh, the student attributed this decline to challenges uh, posed by virtual uh, classes, particularly the lack of uh, uh, in-person or direct monitoring and uh, interaction with their professors. Uh, they mentioned struggling to uh, stay engaged uh, and focused, which is a common issue among uh, students during this time. Often students I, interv often students I interviewed had similar comments emphasizing uh, how the absence of in-person engagement affected their motivation and academic performances. Increased level of stress and anxiety were also prevalent, uh, further, compounding, uh, further compounding the difficulties they faced. Uh, now let's turn to the health impacts of COVID-19. Uh, beyond educational interruptions, there's a growing evidence that even a mild case of COVID-19 have can lead to a cognitive deterioration. Uh, recent studies uh, who contacted uh, re, uh, recent studies shown that the decline is concerning, especially when the when considering the long-term effects of cognitive deficit that may persist uh, a year or more post infections. Uh, these findings suggest that the effects of pandemic extended uh, beyond immediate education disruptions, potentially leading to lasting impairments in cognitive uh, functioning. Uh, in light of uh, okay, in light of these uh, findings, what can be done? Uh, I propose several uh, initiatives. Uh, aim to facilitate recovery and minimizing the uh, adverse effects of pandemic. Uh, a few strategies uh, I proposed in my paper include uh, providing tutoring and remedial classes to students. Uh, schools can offer targeted uh, support to help students which can, which can catch up on missed classes, missed learning opportunities. Uh, this can, uh, this can uh, include both in-person and online tutoring options. Uh, it is also essential to ensure that all students uh, access to reliable technology uh, initiative to provide uh, internet access and devices to disadvantaged families can help bridge the digital divide uh, equipping parents with resources and training to create a support of home learning uh, home learning environment is also crucial. Workshops and online resources can empower parents to foster educational growth at uh, foster educational growth at home. And implementing uh, ongoing uh, evaluation of academic and emotional progress can help students uh, can help. Uh, professors identify students who require additional support and school uh, should prioritize mental health resources to assist students uh, struggling with uh, mental health issues and resources to assist students struggling with stress and anxiety. Uh, there's another really good initiative that can be included is that uh, uh, a program called as SEL which is uh, abbreviated as social, uh, social and emotional learning opportunities. These programs have a curricula which can uh, help children develop resilience and emotional regulation and uh, coping strategies to navigate the challenges they face. 
So in conclusion, the COVID-19 pandemic has posed significant challenges to children's cognitive development and educational progress. However, by implementing targeted strategies, we can work towards uh, providing support to these to students in recovery and minimizing the long-term effects on cognitive disruptions. The insights gained from this research underscore an urgent need to address the issues to enhance the education system and promote cognitive growth in our society. Uh, thank you for your attention. I welcome any questions or further discussions regarding my findings. Thank you so much for that presentation. Such fascinating research. We really appreciate you sharing. And again, congratulations on your winning place in the challenge. Um, and for those listening in, for those who might have joined a couple of minutes late, please feel free to jot down any questions that you have for Akshaya in the chat. Uh, we'll come back to her research during the live Q&A session. Thank you very much. I'd now like to welcome Min and Emma, another first place winning team in the undergraduate cohort from Luther College to share their research about economic epidemiology. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for being here today. And my name is Emma, and I'm going to be presenting um, our uh, project with Min, and we are from Luther College. So our project is titled An Integrated Economic Epidemiology Model and Aiming to Minimize COVID-19 Burden of Disease and Economic Growth Trade-Off. And from now on, we're going to call it an EE model for short. And then so first, um, I want to just give a brief introduction. So. As you all know, COVID-19 is the greatest outbreak of the 21st century and causing a significant disturbance in our life. And stay-at-home orders are very effective in controlling the pandemic spread. And um, those orders might support quicker economic recovery. Um, and also, um, despite short-term economic challenges, stay-at-home orders are vital for long-term public health and economic stability. And so there has been um, previous EE models in covering the SIR model. So SIR model is an uh, epidemiology model. And so it's uh, basically trying to model how individuals progress to different stages to our pandemic. And as so here you can see, um, uh, each compartment is like each stage during an epidemic. And then uh, the Latin symbol is the rate, how they're moving from one compartment to another. So for example, the beta rate is uh, the transmission rate when we're moving from susceptible to be uh, infectious. And then so uh, the EE model in covering SIR aimed to optimize health expenditures, um, but uh, they didn't account for the impact of lockdown policies. And then for COVID-19, uh, the pandemic is more suited for an SEIR model. So basically we're adding another compartment called exposed. And then so therefore for our project, we propose an integrated EE model that optimizes lockdown policies by balancing disease control and, and economic growth. And then so for our project, we took um, data from like uh, various sources. So we took uh, US COVID-19 data from the Google Health uh, Open Data Repository. And then we also uh, took vaccination data from a paper from 2021. And then we also needed COVID-19 testing data and we took it from the US Department of Health and Human Services. And then so now I'm gonna pass the mic over to Moon so he can talk more about our project. Hello. Hello. Did it stop echoing? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the uh, implementation of the economics model. So we're using a model called the FURPUS model, which is the, the main macroeconomic model used at the Federal Reserve Board that is still in use today. They use it to model and simulate like macroeconomic situations to like make predictions and stuff. And so how we're gonna implement it is the stay-at-home orders will decrease civilian employment, which intuitively makes sense, right? And then 
that decrease in civilian employment will affect other macroeconomic variables as modeled by the Ferber's model. And then the way that we're going to assess, like what's the harm is done to the economy is we're going to use GDP loss as a metric. And the baseline for that is the scenario without any state home orders that is defined to have zero GDP losses. And for like specific details on that is that we're going to keep the labor market and accurate output identity sectors, which like civilian employment is one of like the many labor market variables and GDP is one of the many aggregated output identity sectors. We're going to keep them, we're going to let them vary, but while we keep the other variables the same. So like the, the model is going to follow the trajectory it did in the pandemic. Wow, like we can assess like the effect of different stay at home orders on the economy. And the number of employed individuals is going to decrease by 1.9% for every additional week of stay at home order that's in place. And for the pandemic simulation, we're going to use something called the COVASIM model, which is a disease modeling framework developed by the Institute for Disease Modeling. Um, it's going to take in a scenario a, given like a transmission rate beta, which is going to be affected by say at home order, the number of vaccination doses, the number of tests that like we took from like our data we presented earlier. And it's going to output the epidemiological outcome, which is going to be number of infected people, number of deaths, et cetera. And then the implement implementation for that is what we're going to pick better to be 0 0.5 under the state home order, meaning that the virus only spread half as fast under the state home order compared to when no state home order is implemented. And we're going to run a simulation for 1 million people because we didn't have that much computational resources. So 1 million is like a good enough population that we could run. And just, and the other thing is the state home all the scenarios are the same except for the stay home order. So like the testing, the vaccination and everything else is the same. The only thing that's changing is the stay home orders. And we're going to connect the two models, the economic model and the epidemiology model using something called a DALI metric, which is the disability adjusted life years. So essentially one DALI is one lost year of healthy life. And we're going to calculate the DALI metric um, using the step-by-step -step guide and disability wage for COVID-19 um, provided by the European Disease of Network Protocol. Um, so basically, it means that for a certain state of disease, you're going to have a disability weight associated to like how rehabilitating that state is. And then, so one DALI is we're going to transfer that to roughly around 95,000 US dollars, which is like um, the 1.46 times the average GDP per capita, which is like roughly the price, like you, how you define a DALI. And then once you have the DALI, we're going to be able to convert the effect of the pandemic into USD, which is going to be the same metric as the economics model. So we can do optimization on it. And the way that we're going to do optimization is that we're going to start with an initial state home order. And the Covasim and Ferbus model is going to model how the state home orders will affect GDP and DALI. And then the gradient descent optimizer on top of it will try to identify a better order to minimize the total loss of DALI and GDP. So like, imagine like when you're trying to minimize the DALI loss, which is like the pandemic loss, you're essentially like increasing the GDP loss. So we're trying to find like a perfect kind of like balance between that. And we're going to run the gradient descent optimizer for a number of epochs until like we cannot find like a better stay at home order. So that's like our best one that we could find. And after we ran it, we arrived at something around for $2 trillion for GDP loss and like around $9.8 trillion for DALI loss. And the optimal policy that um, our model found was uh, the stay-at-home policy should start around like the fifth week of 2020 and lasting for around like 15 weeks. And here's the plots if you want to see it. And the like uh, black 
uh, dotted line is like the baseline and like the color lines are like um, like the effects of the stay at home policy on the, the economy. And this is GDP and this is civilian employment. And this is the impact of the stay at home policy on the pandemic. Um, for example, like for accumulative infection here, um, you see like the, the gap is not that big, but like the scale is 1 million. So it's, it's quite significant there. Yeah, and the blue one is like no stay at home and the red one is like the best stay at home that we could find. And for like, to wrap it up, the few key results is most of the simulation that we ran, like the daily just outweighs the economic loss. So that means like, most of the time, we the priority should be controlling the pandemic over economic growth. Like, of course, we should keep that in mind that it's affecting economic growth. But like, basically, you should prioritize the controlling the pandemic first. And for a stay at home order policy, so the more rigid the stay at home orders are, the more effective it is at reducing transmission rate. Like, for example, if the transmission rate is reduced to thirty percent instead of fifty the duration of the stay-at-home order is gonna be 12 instead of 15. So essentially if the state government or the federal government issue a more rigid order and people are actually cooperative, we're, we're gonna end up better because we're not gonna be like stay home as long and like less people is gonna die from it. And like the economy is just gonna be better. And lastly, for future works, we're gonna do more on disjointed localized stay-at-home periods to better manage the pandemic and economic recessions. What that means is um, essentially like if you have a county with a high number of infected people, it would make sense to issue stay-at-home orders for local uh, counties. And, you know, instead of like a county is like 200 miles away, that wouldn't really make sense. But like, because of like the how, how the, the other two frameworks are built and like the time that we didn't have. So like, we couldn't really do that. It should, it can be like some, interesting future works to be done. Um, thank, thank you very much for listening. Um, I'll answering question later in the chat. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you both so much, Min and Emma. Congratulations on your winning place of the 2024 Kick Student Paper Challenge as well. Your research, your presentation, and your paper both were super fascinating, and I'm sure we will have some questions for you all during the Q&A. Um, moving right along, I'd now like to pass the virtual microphone to Caitlin from University of California, San Francisco, who took second place in the undergraduate cohort because of her very interesting paper about brain fog and long COVID. Caitlin, you have the floor. Hi. Um, yeah, so thanks um, for having me. Um, I guess to begin a little bit about myself briefly, it's just I graduated this past year from Columbia University, and then I am currently at UCSF doing full-time research post-bac um, in hopes to go to graduate school. Um, and the name of my paper is called Reconceptualizing Brain Fog, Assessing Electroencephalography and Mood Dynamics in Long COVID Patients. Um, so to begin, what is brain fog? Um, it is, brain fog is a symptom that ha existed prior to COVID, and it has been brought into common discourse by COVID-19. So it's often defined by cognitive complaints like forgetfulness, as you see, concentration difficulties, uh, attention problems, and as we'll see a little bit later, slowed processing speed. And these qualities can severely diminish um, quality of life and daily functioning, and they're especially prevalent in long COVID. So what is long COVID? Um, it is a condition in which COVID symptoms persist long after the acute infection has resolved. And according to the CDC, this is when uh, the sim your symptoms are present for more than three months post initial infection. And a meta-analysis by Premraj et al. Uh, demonstrated that brain fog as a post-COVID symptom had a 32% prevalence rate. So that's pretty dramatic. And despite this common occurrence, the physiological and psychological correlates of brain fog still remain poorly understood. So my research paper, um, what was I trying to do? 
Um, I wanted to explore how current conceptualizations of brain fog are overlooking critical factors that traditional cognitive tests, such as the matrix cognitive battery, fail to capture. Um, and how did I go about this? By examining neurophysiological changes via EEG and mood dynamics, we can form a more complete picture that integrates people's lived experiences with objective data. And why did I do this? Um, I thought, you know, this enhanced understanding of brain fog associated factors uh, could facilitate the development of comprehensive post-infection care and targeted rehabilitation strategies. So this is just a little flow chart of the study uh, that I kind of um, am working on. And on the left-hand side, there's two cohorts, um, a neuro-COVID, which are our long COVID patients, and then in the middle, the COVID controls. So the neuro-COVIDs are long COVID patients who are endorsing um, neurological symptoms like difficulty concentrating, um, having trouble paying attention, things like that. And our COVID controls are people who have had COVID and they feel fully recovered and normal now, like probably a lot of people in this meeting. Um, and then they come in for a study visit and that's where they'll do neuropsychological testing, an EEG recording, and then they also completed self-report questionnaires. And if you look on the right-hand side, we have a pre-pandemic healthy control cohort, and that is EEG data that was collected from a previous research study prior to the pandemic to ensure that none of those individuals had COVID because it's kind of impossible to do that now or it'd be more expensive to recruit people who definitely didn't have COVID post-pandemic. So my paper's preliminary hypotheses were that the long COVID patients would, one, perform worse on the neuropsych test compared to COVID controls and the overall population norm. They would exhibit slower EEG-based event-related potentials compared to COVID controls and the pre-pandemic healthy controls. And that three, they would report significantly greater depression and anxiety compared to COVID controls. So my first hypothesis, that they would perform worse on the cognitive tests, um, they actually proved not to. Um, it didn't. They didn't significantly differ on this, um, and that's not entirely surprising. Um, there's been previous. That's kind of consistent with previous research findings that long COVID patients reporting concentration and memory difficulties do not show object objective deficits in cognitive performance. And actually, surprisingly, the long COVID um, patients perform significantly better on the working memory tasks despite reporting these like subjective cognitive decline. So that was a little surprising, but um, uh, this kind of just underscores the discrepancy in people's subjective experiences and their objective performance on these cognitive tests. And that's why to better understand this discrepancy, ERPs um, offer a more promising avenue for further exploration of brain fog. So we examined the um, event-related, uh, P300 event-related potential using an auditory task. And participants were presented with a combination of standard, novel, and target tones. And essentially, the P300 is a neurophysiological index of processing speed. So it peaks about 300 milliseconds after the onset of a tone. And we select these peaks by picking the most positive peak within um, the time window. And for my paper, I was looking at P300 latency, which reflects neural processing speed in milliseconds. And this is the time in which it takes for your brain to process the sound. So not that it's registering it heard something, but you're processing what you just heard. And then we also looked at reaction time, which is an additional thing. So you have the neural processing speed and then you add in that physical motor response to execute the press. Um, and uh, for this, um, it actually proved that if you look at figure one, both the long COVID and COVID controls had significantly slower P300s than the pre-pandemic healthy controls. And there was no significant difference between the long COVIDs and the COVID controls. So this difference is not significant, but compared to the pre-pandemic cohort, that's where there's, you're seeing significantly slower reaction uh, processing speed, I should say, because P300, just to remind you, equals neural speed, and neural speed is slower in people who had COVID. And then we also looked at reaction time, and this was also significantly slower in the long COVID and COVID controls. And so delayed reaction times reflect both motor plus neural slowing. And just one thing to note with both of these figures is that because our pre-pandemic healthy controls um, are younger because they were recruited from a previous research study, we statistically removed the effects of normal aging from the COVID subjects data, which is why in both of these figures you see that the legacies 
are at um, zero. So basically anything, any significant change that we're seeing is a pathological aging. What you would, um, changes or slowing that's beyond what we would expect for normal aging processes. And the, these findings highlight the sensitivity of electrophysiological and reaction time measures in revealing the lasting impact of COVID on cognitive processing speed. And then my third hypothesis was that they would report significantly greater depression and anxiety compared to the controls. And this is this was something that was quite strong in what we saw. Um, so as hypothesized, the non-COVIDs were significantly more depressed and more anxious since having COVID. You see that in the left two bars. And then they also reported a lot more difficulty moving around and having a harder time doing usual activities. And those two components are also just daily life functioning measures that are often affected by depression. Um, and this is all relative to the COVID control patients. So this association between long COVID and this like, greater depression and anxiety underscore the significant disruption to their daily well-being, like overall well-being and daily functioning. Um, okay, and then summary of my paper was just that the EEG results indicate persistent neurological alterations despite the absence of observed cognitive deficits at a quantitative level. The P300 ERP, as well as the reaction time measures, emerges as a promising tool for the early detection of cognitive dysfunction related to long COVID because it is a much more sensitive measure, particularly, particularly in cognitive neuroscience than like structural MRI or neuropsychological testing. You'll, um, you'll might see changes sooner with um, electrophysiological recordings. And then the increased depression and anxiety in long COVID patients highlight the broader psychological impact of this condition beyond cognitive domains. So future longitudinal studies are essential to investigate whether these observed abnormalities in long COVID patients persist over time or revert back to pre-pandemic levels. And what my paper was trying to get at was just saying, you know, brain fog should not be tied to cognitive challenges alone, as is often seen in the literature, but rather encompass anomalies across biological and psychological domains. And this holistic approach will promise to advance our understanding and treatment of brain fog, aiming to improve the quality of life for those affected by these debilitating COVID effects. Um, and my last page is just my acknowledgments. I just wanted to say thank you to the Brain Imaging and EEG Lab at UCSF for allowing me to be part of this project. Um, and then also doc a big thank you to Dr. Jessica Hua. Um, she mentored me throughout the writing process of this paper. So that was really invaluable for me. <laughs> and that's that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Caitlin. What a fantastic presentation um, and a great paper as well. Um, and it's funny because Lauren just put in the chat exactly what I was going to say. Your research really does tie in so well to the Data Essentials Project, which also focuses on long COVID. Um, there are um, variables in that data set that have to deal with emotional health as well. So um, Lauren, you and I are on the same wavelength right now. <laughs> And see, we just said the same thing again. And um, so it's just a, a really great presentation. We really appreciate you sharing that with us. Um, again, a reminder to everyone, please drop your, the, any questions that you have for Caitlin in the chat, and we will have a live Q&A session after our final presentation, which will be um, right now, I'll pass the virtual microphone over to Carol from the University of Virginia, who was the first place of our graduate cohort in the challenge. So Carol, we welcome you to share your slides and begin your presentation. Uh, thank you, Emily. Uh, uh, okay, can you see my screen? Okay, uh, uh, thank you everyone. Uh, my name is Kairul. I am a uh, fourth year CSP PhD student at University of Virginia. Uh, I'm very happy to share my work here today. Uh, this is what we actually did as part of a uh, capstone project during third year uh, in COVID. Uh, and you can see like, a lot of my uh, teammates uh, present during that project. And uh, this actually wanted to it was like a part of interpreting different deep learning models for COVID-19. So I will probably share some of the other works we also did in the same domain later. Uh, so to begin with, like how we came up with the idea, uh, a lot of the policies in during COVID-19 time was based on like different population age groups, like trying to give priority for vaccination to certain age groups or 
uh, shutting down your offices because a population from Sarkanese groups are being more COVID-19 positive. So we had the idea, like, can we actually calculate or even some way, like, predict how much certain age groups will be affected by COVID-19? And that's also using deep learning models, considering the data we have in hand. Which was very challenging at the beginning because we really did not have enough data. And you know, like deep learning models or neural network models really need a lot of data to start giving good prediction or something. And then there was a lot of like uh, difficulty with collecting good data also. Uh, so we started working on uh, collecting data for all of the United States counties. We found there was more than uh, 3,000 uh, 3, United uh, State counties we could get data for. And then we collected data for different ACE groups. And we defined the ACE groups following CDC because that helped us later verify the ground truth uh, that whether what we are predicting is really good or not. Uh, so we collected data for like 0 to 4 or 5 to 17, or same, same, these kinds of age groups, so that we could verify like what happens for baby teenagers or maybe middle people or maybe for elderly people as well. And for the model, we are really trying to predict what will be the number of COVID cases for those counties, given we have past information like population percentage for different counties, as well as what was the COVID-19 cases for those US counties. Uh, and this is also at like daily levels. So we are taking around previous two weeks of daily data to predict what will be for the around next two weeks at each county. So we have more than 3,000 different time series. Uh, so for the training, we used a very recent transformer-based models at that time. In another of our work, we showed that this model was doing uh, better than the other recent deep learning models as well. So that kind of like established it as a uh, very good model to learn like spatial temporal data. Uh, and uh, we used like for validation and testing, we also like separated some future data. So I have like last two weeks for test and the previous two weeks for validation, which is really important because you do not want to keep the data in the training for testing as well. Otherwise it will not be a good validation. Uh, but our main focus was actually the interpretation. Like, can we really interpret what are the importance of different age groups? Like, are the elderly people more important or like the children uh, or something else? But uh, the main thing is that like, it can really be different from county to county because the number of population in different counties and their demographic and distribution can be very widely different. And uh, we used the sensitivity analysis method to actually estimate that. Uh, to very uh, simplify, the method changes the input a little bit and see how much the model's output changes because of that. And then just takes the ratio. So if the change is very big, for example, we maybe change like very small data value in the input and then see the model is predicting maybe two, two times COVID-19 cases right now then that will be like a very big sensitivity for that particular input. Maybe that was like teenagers age distribution or something. So that's how we can kind of like quantify the sensitivity. And we did that for like every day in the past input and for every age groups. That's how we uh, contrast into what are the sensitivity of these different population age groups. Uh, but then again, like even if we get a number for different age groups, how do we actually evaluate like this is good or bad? So we collected uh, age groups COVID-19 case data from CDC, which was like for our study period, like around two years of data. And we, you can see the ground truth on the right hand side and see like some age groups had like a lot more COVID-19 cases compared to others. But also you can see that it keeps changing with time. So it's like also like a temporal problem, but that also like for the population age groups, it can, can change a lot. Uh, and in summary, when we did the like ground truth comparison, like overall calculation, we say like uh, we ranked the different age groups based on like how, what the percentage of that they, they being infected. And we can see like the population age groups, like the young stars, there were like the infection rate was the highest among them. And then maybe the people who are attending jobs, partly because the office was not like fully closed in many cases. So they had to go to office outside interaction. And that also uh, contributed to them getting like more COVID infected. 
And then we actually compared that to the scores what we are getting from the sensitivity analysis. So this shows the rank of the sensitivity. So if the rank was like, the score was very high, that would get one, then two, three, four, something like that. So we see this is the rank we were predicting for our interpretation. And this was the actual rank during that two weeks test period window. And we can see like the difference is like very small, at least like around one or 1.5. So at least we are able to like predict that very well that how it will be the sensitivity of different people uh, during that COVID-19 time. And this is actually predicting for the future. Uh, but where do you go from there? So based on this work, we also had like some related works. In one work, we looked inside the deep learning model and see what kind of patterns the model was learning. In other work, we actually did a like black box approach, like we only have input output, and then we explained what kind of patterns uh, are present in the input that's actually affecting your output. And in one of our ongoing work, we are working with LLMs, kind of trying to see if we have like a very small data, can we really use LLM for those cases to give good prediction, which is also important for COVID-19, because we know like if this is like a very recent outbreak, it's not possible to have enough good data for that. And deep learning models will often fail for those cases where foundation models are really good. This is an ongoing work we are doing and it will be in submission soon. So uh, thank you for listening to my presentation. Please feel free to ask any questions. Thank you, Carol, so much. And thank you to all of the student researchers for sharing such great work today. I will just let you all know that you made the um, it, you made it incredibly difficult for the judges this year, which is a good thing. Very good thing. Um, we had such fantastic work submitted to the 2024 Kick Student Paper Challenge. And I, I've said it a bunch of times already, but really congratulations because you all put so much effort into um, writing your papers and building these presentations and sharing them today and inspiring the student working group. So um, thank you all so much for being here. I'm going to um, share my screen one more time quickly. So while all of you are dropping your last minute questions for our presenters into the chat, I just wanna offer you all ways to jump right into research projects that may align with your interests. The KIC and the NSDC offer over 13 data science projects to date to support and guide you in learning data science tools and techniques. So most of you are uh, have some sort of interest in healthcare. You can jump right into the Data Essentials Project. Um, we have other projects like building a dashboard using COVID-19 data and more. Maybe you're focusing on climate and sustainability. You can jump into a permafrost-fed lakes project to learn more about melting ice in our lakes. Um, maybe you're interested in creating real world recommendations on how to make roads safer in New York City and um, sharing your findings with the Department of Transportation. Then you can jump into the Transportation Data Science Project. But just generally, if you're looking to learn a new skill, a new technique, something new to add to your resume, you can try out any of these projects to learn um, programming, uh, data visualizations, data storytelling, creative and critical thinking, and more. So all of these projects can be found at the link that I will drop in the chat in just a second. And as we segue into the Q&A session of today's webinar, I'd also like to briefly plug all of the ways that you can stay in touch with the COVID Information Commons. So please check out our website, subscribe to our newsletter. If you have any questions or suggestions for any upcoming events, you can always email us at info at covidinfocommons.net. And again, I will share all of these links with you in the chat right now. Um, so that you can peruse our channels at your own pace and keep an eye out for communications from us about all of our new upcoming events and activities. So now that I've done all of this admin, we've heard from our wonderful student presenters today, I would like to open it up to the Q&A uh, from our audience. Several of you have already posted comments and questions in the chat box, so thank you all for that. And I'm going to pass the virtual mic back over to our executive director, Florence Hudson, and the moderator of today's Q&A session. Thank you, Emily, and fantastic presentations, every, everybody. As I was listening to you, I was thinking, Thank goodness these people are learning this at such a young age. So when there are future pandemics, you'll be able to leverage this great research that you've done into the future. So thank you very much for that. So first, Akshaya, if you're there, there are a couple of questions that we have for you. 
Um, one person asked if you can give sources to the studies and research you mentioned um, and and for the claim that children born in the COVID era had lower motor skills and other issues. So if you want to put those in the chat, you can. In the meantime, we were Googling while you were presenting because we loved your work so much. And we actually found a report from August of 2021 of a longitudinal study of 672 children from Rhode Island um, that has run since 2011. And it's very sad, but the reports, uh, it reports that those born after the pandemic began showed results on the Mullen scales of early learning that corresponded to an overall IQ score of 78, which is a drop of 22 points from the average of previous cohorts. How alarming is that? So did you use information like that or from other countries or do you have any sources to share? Yeah, uh, I have a couple of sources to share. I'm putting that in the chat box. Mm -hmm. And it's a really concerning issues these days that uh, IQ levels have been severely dropped, which might affect the future educational opportunities of them. Uh, I'm, at that, I'm sending the links to the resources I found. It's very thoughtful. Thank you very much. And it was a great insight, uh, insight shared in the chat box that we can in, uh, incorporate the uh, Gardner theory of multiple intelligence. It's a really good insight that I would like to incorporate in my uh, further research. Thank you so much for that. Excellent. That's from Lauren on a train. She's so so <laughs> she's so connected. Um, that's wonderful, um, and uh, so that's great. So why don't we move on to a question for Emma and Min. Um, could you talk a bit about how you selected the data sets and the models that you've worked with? Um, students who are working on the new data essentials project for the KIC um, have the option to merge the CDC data set with other uh, data sources. Um, and so how you found your data um, and that you know that it's reliable and trustworthy. Yes, um, thank you for the questions. Uh, so for our data, so um, we're just trying to find the like publicly available data that's like out there. And so um, we pick our data from like already published paper. So it's more trustworthy. And then we also took from the Google Open Data Repository, which is also uh, like, we, they, ha they have like a paper for it. So we're like, oh, that seems very trustworthy. And then so for the model, so for our epidemiology model, so like two years ago, I had like a, a project working on Covaxin. So that's why uh, we utilized it for like uh, our project this year. And then for the economic model, we just Google it. And then we found out the US um, economic department has like the economic model to help uh, predict the economy, so we're like, oh, it's, it's from the government, so it's very trustworthy, so we just run with it, yeah. Excellent, that's really great. Thank you so much. Um, so we wanna try to get one question to each person and we can roll back into other ones. Um, and so for Caitlin, um, we noticed that you mentioned interventions for patients exhibiting impacts of long COVID. Are there interventions that we know work? <laughs> um, I think, I present it's still relatively a novel thing that not a lot of people are treating there's some clinics or there and they have existing support groups for long covid but in terms of um interventions i don't think as much is really present yeah that's fair that's what i was thinking too because we might all start those exercises right if we've had covid <laughs> um and another question um that came up uh, people were asking, so how do you get funding for projects? Um, so I can answer that, but why don't you answer your personal story? Um, well, obviously, um, in my case, I'm in a privileged position where I, I am working full time in a lab. So in the project that I am like leading um, under Dr. Ford, um, it just happens to be on long COVID. So it's just kind of serendipitous. Um, we received funding from the Department of Veteran Affairs, as well as the NIH. And um, I think that's it, maybe a little bit from UCSF as well. But I think for this project specifically, I think only the NIH and um, the VA, we get a lot of, we're located at the San Francisco VA. So that's why we get a lot of support from them. That's great. So yeah, so the message is make friends with researchers that are getting funded and they can <laughs> actually, right? <laughs> and, um, and they can actually, 
you know, right into their grant. It has to be before they submit it, because when you submit a grant, you say, this is exactly what I'm going to do for exactly this amount of money. But they don't have to know who you are. They just have to know they want to engage a student. So if you can engage, uh, or a postdoc, so if you can, or a postbac, so if you can um, engage researchers in areas that are of interest to you, then when they have an opportunity, they might be able to bring you into it. And you could look for the COVID researchers in the COVID Information Commons, you know, because some of them are doing longitudinal research and go for additional grants. So leverage the kick, look for, you can look for researchers by institution, by state, by, you know, NIH versus NSF. So leveraging the COVID information comments can help you find um, other humans. And then also being aware of what's going on in your area, or it could be a school you want to go to for, you know, your graduate degree. You could start contacting them. It doesn't have to be where you are right now. And I see Caitlin nodding her head. Okay, great. That's wonderful. Um, and uh, for Karul, a, a lot of our data projects involve spatiotemporal analysis. Could you talk a bit more about how your research managed this type of data? For example, um, they say they would imagine that rural individuals traveled further distances than urban residents, and they would expect something similar for different age groups. Um, the zero to four age group probably travels less than the individuals in their 30s. That's fair, unless they go with all the individuals in their 30s. So could you talk a little bit about how you did the spatiotemporal analysis? Uh, sure, thanks. Uh, good question. So uh, for our case, the spatial data were that come to base like population demographics. Uh, but then again, like whether uh, uh, the travel in between the counties, that's also like very crucial because people moving from each place to another contributes greatly to the spread of pandemic. But then again, like uh, in practical sense, we found it like really difficult to get reliable data on the travel in between because either those are like incomplete or then like this is missing. And then that really depends on whether people are using GPS or not. So someone travels in between without using any Google map or Apple map something, then there is actually no trace or like information about that travel. Uh, so I think like the data availability was like a big uh, question for that spatial temporality. And then if you use like graphs, models like that, that will be like really important to actually uh, simulate the scenarios. But for our case, we only used kind of uh, like the county demographics because it was much simpler. And we had the data from US uh, Bureau of uh, uh, US Bureau. So that actually was also like very reliable. So that's why we actually followed that approach. Very good. Thank you for sharing that. That's great. Um, then I'd like to go back up to Akshaya, if we can, and then ask an overall question. Akshaya, are you still there? Yeah, I see. Yes. Um, so a question that came up was, you know, we love when we see um, students that are doing primary market research, right? You're doing your own interviews. You know, it's good to do secondary market research when you read other people's research. And then including primary market research is very cool. So um, can you say more about how you organize the individual interviews as part of your research and how you structured your qualitative research? Yeah, of course. Uh, so um, more, it was generally a uh, informal research, which uh, mostly included of open-ended questions. Uh, it mostly gave insight. In, uh, the uh, research was, I mean, uh, the research was mostly about their academic performances, emotional struggles they had to face during these times, and uh, uh, the stress and anxiety they faced due to uh, online learning and missed opportunities. Uh, they were informally talking about these, which were noted and uh, incorporated in my research. Very cool. Thank you so much. You know, we find that very inspiring. Actually, one of the students who won the first year did primary research, um, and it was very interesting um, what it shows. So thank you for sharing that. And an overall question, which is always a go good question. And first of all, everyone's saying, oh my gosh, all these presentations were so great. Every presentation was one fabulous. Um, and then someone wanted to know how y'all are collecting data sets. Are they open source? Are you collected on your own? I think we're hearing it's a mix of things. And they want to get enlightened regarding the algorithms being used with the data and how to decide um, that this was the aspect that needed to be worked on. Is it decided by the data set or by the algorithm? 
what an interesting question, or perhaps the problem you're trying to solve. So does anybody want to talk about that? You know, Cruel, I'm thinking your research may have something to do with that. There's the data, there's the algorithms, there, how do you look at it? Would you like to share your thoughts on that? Uh, sure. I mean, data is always a big issue when you're doing to, uh, going to research. And I think like for COVID-19 also, like initially it was a big issue because a lot of the data was sensitive, like you are getting it from hospitals. And then I think like the coordination between the hospitals also was a big reason that initially a lot of the data was either missing or not synchronized at all. So first, when we were studying, we tried to like focus on very reliable sources like uh, uh, CDC or John Hopkins University. There was also like university, uh, like the uh, University of New York. Uh, they also started collecting data. So those are the like reliable places that we could really believe like the data they collect will be like as accurate as possible. Like it probably will not be 100% accurate, but also like the probably the best we can get. And then the second thing I think is a, like a very good source is a lot of published paperwork. So we generally go to related paperwork in a very good conference venues and then see what kind of data set they are using or what sources they are using. A lot of the time that is a very good source actually to use in our paper because uh, then it is like very established, very standard. Everyone kind of not like knows about it. Like, oh, it was published in a very good way, like Nature or someone else. Uh, so that actually is a good place to start. Like if we collect data from very unknown or suspicious sources, the credibility is like very low. And for epidemic data, that's I think is like very crucial because it's related to people's health, also like to the economics. So getting a very reliable source as well as if it is published, that I, I think like is the best way to start. Very interesting. Thank you for sharing that detailed answer. If we can go a few minutes longer, everybody is loving all this. Is that, is that okay, Emily? Can we ask another question? Okay, great. Yes, sure. Okay, great. So another question for Caitlin. I think Caitlin's still here, right? Yep, there we go. Um, what are the demographic characteristics of your three test cohorts, age, sex, race, et cetera? Do they play a factor in the neuropsych and EEG tests? Uh, yes, they definitely do. Um, so for our long COVID and COVID control cohorts, um, those are age matched um, and also gender matched um, one to one. Um, so, but the thing is the average age off the top of my head is about, I think it's 38, I wanna say, because the, the people who are endorsing long COVID are a bit older and the reason why so my pre-pandemic cohort um we took it from another research study um in our lab and a lot of um, other projects in our lab focus on schizophrenia and schizophrenia um tends to be predominantly men and also um a bit younger um when we're studying the that population so that cohort is a lot uh younger as a, on average that's why we z scored the eeg data and react Reaction times to account for that because reaction time and as well as neural processing speed is like um, solidly like affected by age and it shows that each year your P300 um, gets a little bit smaller amplitude and a little bit slower um, as you get older. Um, it's kind of inevitable and same with reaction time you get slower as you age. So that's why we Z scored it to account for um, any aging effects and then from there any significance we found was an additional pathological kind of slowing or aging that you might expect with like Alzheimer's or dementia. Um, but yes, so we do um, match our, in terms of recruitment. Um, yes, and neuropsych is on its own when you score it in the, there's like a program that you use to score it. It accounts for um, age, your socioeconomic status, your how many years you've been in school and it, it takes all that into consideration. Usually it gen generates either like a T-score or a standard score, depending on which um, test you're doing. Very helpful. Well, I have to say, I'm so impressed with all of your presentations. They were they were excellent. I'm really impressed with the way you can so easily discuss the content as well. You know, sometimes people are just able to present it and it's like in a little box, but you're all very fluent in your content. And it shows the passion and purpose you have in your research, which is really a wonderful thing. So you're all wonderful role models for this. Thank you so much for presenting and for sharing with us. Thank you everyone who participated today. Um, and Emily, back to you. 
Thank you so much. Yes, I want to echo what Florence said. Um, we really appreciate all of the students, the student presenters being able to join today, share their wonderful research. Um, again, the judges had a tough time making decisions and you all did that. It was such a, it was such a great um, challenge this year. You made it so exciting. The the diversity of topics across the board. I mean, we heard about long COVID. We heard about economic effects. We heard about all of these different interesting and very pertinent um, um, discussion topics today. And, um, you know, COVID isn't going anywhere, which is what <laughs> we like to say on the team. And so that's why we really want to be in this space, spearheading some of this research. And, you know, you all are going to be the leaders in this space. So we really appreciate it. Thank you to those who joined today. Um, for those who missed any part of today's event, it will it has been recorded and it will be posted on our YouTube channel. So we appreciate it. We hope you will join our upcoming events. Check out for communications from the kick. If you have any questions about the Data Essentials Project, feel free to reach out to us. It's a really great project. We're super excited to see your presentations in December if you choose to do so. And, um, and feel free to reach out the, to the team with any additional questions, comments, or concerns. So thank you all for joining today and we will see you next time. Take care, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Thank you.